How are you, Nikki? I'm great. How are I'm you, awesome. babe? I'm so well. So before we kick off um, today with our chat, I want to just introduce you to Nikki Smith, who is absolutely beautiful. Um, and I'll tell you a little bit about her background. So I'm going to read it so that I don't miss any key points. So Nikki is a psychologist. She works in career change. She's a coach and she's a strength coach and has um, 17 years experience both in Australia and the UK. So she helps people find their best fit role and optimize it, which is awesome. So Nikki guides and cheerleads individuals to create their dream life, best uh, best fit role or business, right? Awesome. Yeah. So she um, helps people create one with more freedom and flexibility, playing to strengths, interests, and lifestyle needs. Uh, she elevates others' visions and confidence through strengths coaching. Um, helping people to value their strengths and see them as their superpower and give them the knowledge and tools to use them every day, which is awesome. Nikki typically helps clients reclaim 5 to 15 hours in their work week to do more of the other things they love, which, which is exactly why we've asked you to talk with us today. <laughs> and so you and I have had a conversation recently, um, something that has become really bold in conversations in clinics, something that's coming up more and more, um, is that people are exhausted. And I think a lot of this comes down to the modern, I, I kind of frame it like the modern inner city lifestyle. And I think originally when I was thinking about this chat with you and, and the conversations I've been having with patients, um, I had it in my mind that it was largely female based and the reality is it's not, it's men and women. So welcome and thank you for, for joining us today. So what we want to get out of today, Nikki, is that, um, like I said, having lots of conversations with people who are overwhelmed, unclear, and really everything is ending up stressing and exhausting them. So I wondered if we can just dive in and explore even what the modern world looks like for people, and then maybe come up with some ideas about how people can navigate it so that they're not feeling as impacted. Sounds like a great plan. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, would you like to start with the yeah, yeah, how modern day is transformed? Yeah. yeah, absolutely. So, if we go way, way back, and this is going to probably challenge some people's, you know, gender role ideas. But really, um, if we go to remote communities even these days, or if we look back at how humans have really lived for such a long, thousands and thousands of years, um, men with their testosterone have gone off and protected and hunted and you know and made sure that we're all safe. Um, and provided, and you know, the women tended to have been um, uh, heart based and fed and nurtured and connected and all of that sort of stuff. And um, while that's kind of still largely the case, there's been quite a shift, hasn't there? Yeah, there's been a massive shift. Yeah, yeah we're, we're tending to both do both roles now. Yeah, and like you were just explaining to me before we started, that in your family, you are the primary breadwinner and your husband is secondary and you know even thinking about society um, in all the ways it's changing you know it's single parents and it's not just single mums it's single dads and it's double income with many children or with no children and that can be stressful so it does it feel to you a little bit like you know when you're talking with people that there's this been this um energy build up that's been it almost feels like it's at this point where we're coping with as much as we can yeah, um, I'm actually feeling similarly anterior because I actually think that um, really, I'm, I think it's beyond that. I think that it's beyond what people are coping with. Mm. So I think I think organisations um, on the whole, the non-flexible ones, yeah. are actually expecting insane amounts from their workers. You know, um, numbers of hours are just constantly climbing. Um, I know a lot of organisations claim that they're offering, you know, more flexible family work, you know, organisations, mm. but um, unfortunately, too often, it's not actually translating into the culture of the organisation, so then people don't feel like they can actually take advantage of a policy that exists yeah. um, and, you know, work remotely or work more flexibly or... Um, negotiate a four-day work week or things like that because no one else is doing it. Mm. So, I mean, I typically, people come to me when they're usually stretched beyond belief or they know that 
they what they're doing isn't sustainable for say more than six or twelve months more. Mm-hmm. So I'm typically seeing people who is who own the organisations where the culture doesn't match the mission of, of providing a flexible family friendly place. Mm-hmm. So I might be seeing a slightly biased sample, yeah. um, but it's 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 all I hear really. So I th- I think that. Um, between the organisation's expectations and individuals' expectations on themselves. Mm. Um, you know, many people do want to are driven and want to achieve and want um, success and work and they think that or believe it that translates to hours and mm. uh, have a certain definition of success which actually doesn't necessarily match their definition of success with family. So then they're constantly torn. That's, That's what I think. That's a good point and it's, and it's something I definitely wanted to bring up with you. So organisations having structure and policy and, and, you know, boundaries for work, um, how people work, um, is one thing. And I think there's a traditional belief about how a 38-hour work week has to look, you know. But I think, for me, the thing that's most interesting is if you have those really sit down and just like, let's just pull the layers off conversations with people. I find it really largely comes back to people's expectations of themselves, And that's tricky, right? Um, In a time where being successful is important, Mm. you know, as a concept. (laughs) So it's like it's not just an external pressure. There's an internal pressure that people are facing. And I had a conversation with a beautiful woman yesterday who works part-time and has a beautiful family, and she has exhaustion um, stuff going on for her. And when we talk about stress, she doesn't identify with stress because in her mind she thinks of the people who are stressed, major stressed, and you can validate it because you can say they work 60 hours and they've got eight children and <laughs> or whatever, you know. And so if your stress looks different from that, there's a sense that people don't believe that they're entitled to feel mm-hmm. stressed. Which is yeah, interesting. I, I agree. Yeah, I see that and agree with that. Um, I often, I often bring everything back to someone's strengths. So often, people who feel like that have an achiever strength or a responsibility strength. The responsibility strength is, I will take psychological ownership of what I do and I will follow through no matter what. And the achiever strength is, I love progress. I love achieving. Give me a to do list. I'm going to tick it off. Now. If you've got one or both of those, you just you are, that is often how you look. You're like, well, I'm just doing what needs to be done. There are people far worse off than me, um, and often people with the achievement responsibility strength, men and women, directed into work and trade off on health or relationships or family. So yeah, there is there is a solution to it, which is to adapt that strength to other areas of their life, and you know, work with people like you, Jake, and B. To put these health habits into place. Yeah. yeah. So the reality is I've got a job, my husband's got a job, we've got one kid or multiple children, um, I need time to catch up with my friends, I need time for fitness, I'm trying to get healthy because things aren't going well. Like, yeah. where do you play? Where's How do you reshape that? Is it about physically reshaping it or is it about mentally reshaping it? Um, the... Well, I think it's about both. Mm. I think in terms of, I think mentally reshaping it, I often encourage people to think about in 10-minute increments. So if, you, if, you, if you've if you got the story that I have no time to fit in, you know, um, I, miss, I miss yoga, I miss seeing my friends, I have no time. Like everything because, um, you know, we give, we often get into the habit of giving to work, giving to family and having nothing left over, like literally nothing left over. Mm. And I feel since having kids, I've had to relearn how do I give to myself? How do I actually fill up my own cup? I'm so good at it before kids. (laughs) And now I'm terrible at it. You had so much time. I think often in terms of the 10-minute increment, and I, I want people to pursue pleasure or fun or filling your cup. So it might be... Um, the kids are going to have 10 minutes of screen time and I'm having a bath, mm. right? I'm coming first here. Yeah. It might be, um, you know, I'm going to call a friend for 10 minutes before I start work because I just actually need to connect with someone. It might be, um, you know, even though no one else at work is taking a lunch break, I'm going to take 20 minutes and walk around the block or 10, even 10, I've got a client doing 10 minutes around the block. Yeah. So I often think about in terms of 10 minutes, 
Into, but I also know there's usually a lot you can do to reshape your work week. So um, one of the things my clients love is finding out that when you get interrupted in a task, because so many people working in open plan offices, aren't they? Mm. When you get interrupted by a task, it can take 5 to 45 minutes to get back into the task. It redu- so on average, it reduces your productivity by about 30%. So I encourage them to say, um, depending on your work role, of course, if you're on reception, probably not possible, but if you've got any kind of desk-related <laughs> I've got role. I've any more calls. <laughs> Yeah, can you, can you um, book a quiet, most people can book a quiet room and I get people into the habit of early in the day when you've got the willpower, so from neuroscience we've learnt that we may only have willpower for three to four tasks a day, like yeah. nothing, early in the day, can you carve out that hour or even if you want to be a black belt ninja at it, two hours, in a quiet room and actually get some focused work done. So clients who are doing this are finding that they're naturally finish, like coming up for air and finishing work earlier. They think, I can stop now because they've had a focused period of time. It means you've given your brain a chance to work optimally, yeah. um, but also they're getting more done. Um, can I just ask so, on that point? So coming up for air, say they'd be a total ninja and get two hours of super efficient work done and they come up. Are people likely to think, oh, now I can. Now I'm done. Or are they likely to think my inbox is full? I can keep smashing out tasks. So this is when you're, yeah. Look, oh, look, most achievers and responsibilities are like, woohoo, more time. I'll do another task. Yeah. <laughs> so I get this is when it comes into what is your. Um, so I talk about with work. It's about your why. It's about your strengths. It's about your definition of success. It's about your values. Now, um, so when the the leaving. The leaving work question, I feel like that's kind of almost what you're saying. You freed up some time. It's, oh, it's actually 5 o'clock and you could probably leave work and usually leave work at 6 or 7. Then you're going to probably feel guilty about that. Most Mm -hmm. people do. But if you're clear on what your definition of success is and your values are, if you're clear on the value you've given to that job that day, then, for example, one of my definitions of success is teaching my kids something new each day and it might be a new word in a book or it might be a new card game or it might we did a cookie recipe the other night so I that helps me to draw a line in the sand for work um, and and do something with them because otherwise I mean I actually love what I do I, I would like to keep working I would like to finish tasks so it's you know I understand the tension I've got a lot of choice I run a business mm. um, but it still takes discipline to say okay those emails can wait or I'm going to go home, spend time with my kids, and I'm going to do 30 minutes of emails from, you know, 7.30 to 8. Mm. Yeah, so it's when I think because we're talking a lot of people with kids and balancing the juggle of kids and work, it's really important for us to just get to know ourselves again because we've changed. We've Mm. absolutely changed. And we want to be the before and after all in one, but we need to review what's most important to us because... At the end of our lives, we don't want to regret the time we spent at work or the time we spent at home. And it is such a tension. I call it the divided heart. It's it's such a tension. Mm-hmm. And, you know, kids just want to be with you. Even I, I don't work long hours, but because I work from home, my kids see me working and they think I work a lot of hours. I mean, you... In a way, you can't win, but you need to be sure on what's important to you and what you can offer and be okay with that. Yeah, absolutely. One of the other things that has come up a little bit um, recently, and this has been women, but again, could be men or women, is um, so the ladies I've been talking to have been um, amongst and trying to get the balance right and obviously are seeing us because things aren't particularly flash for them in the health department. Um, But they've got really demanding jobs. Oh, you've gone. They've got really demand. Can you still hear me, Nick? Yeah. Yeah. Yay. Yay. So they've got really demanding jobs that are, are taking a massive um, physical, emotional toll on them and really impacting the families and they don't feel like they can move away from them. So move away from the job, is that what you mean? Yeah, that they feel like it's part of their identity or that they should be able yeah. to cope or yeah. whatever other reason. I find that really fascinating because evidence is all suggesting quite strongly that it's not the right move right now, the way that it looks. Yeah. Yeah, so I think I've got some reassuring news there. I think the first thing to say is 
if you're wondering, is it me or the job and why can't I cope, the answer is almost always it's there's something wrong with the job for you. Okay? It's not you. You're fine. There's a mismatch between you and the job. So there's something wrong about the job. Now, within that, there are usually some opportunities for you to reshape the job, and that's where getting to know your strengths really helps. If you're feeling drained, you're likely not to be playing to your strengths in your job, mm. or you're working too, or you're working more hours than is good for you right now. Um, so there's usually an opportunity to reshape what you're currently doing if you don't feel like you can step away. Mm. Um, there, um, it's hard to find good flexible part-time jobs, but again, the traditional recruitment system is a bit broken because it's all about computer um, screening, but there is another way of getting flexible part-time jobs, and that's through connecting with people, being clear on what you want. So if you're thinking, I want to work, but it's not this, there is a, a clever strategic way you can do it. Yeah. But I think that you're also touching on why aren't we okay for stepping back out of work and into parenting? Is that what you're saying as well? Absolutely. Because society doesn't reward it. Yeah. Society does not. Re society rewards money and achievements and um, you know work and that's all people. So much of the conversations in society around what do you do like that's often and I feel people are very uncreative when it comes to conversations. <laughs> I t I rarely ask what do you do. I ask things like what's been the best thing about your week. Yeah. Something like that, which gives people the opportunity to talk about what they want to. So I think if society doesn't reward parenting. I'm trying to change that. You know, I'm really active in my business of I might um, feel like I need to talk to a client on a parenting day, um, but I'll say I'm parenting, you know, and I get clients on their CV to write parenting, not to fake why they haven't been working. I've been really proud of this. Yeah. So look, my, if you're... I grew up with a mother who was a social worker and she worked in permanent care, so taking kids out of foster care into permanent families. Yeah. And so from attachment theory, if you can financially be around for the first two years, there are a lot of benefits of doing that because that's when our children form their, you know, attachment to human to other humans. I'm not saying that to make anyone feel guilty. I'm saying it to if you're needing more data in your head about why it's okay to stay at home and that's something to draw upon I think you need to surround um, I think you need to surround yourself with parenting cheerleaders I think you need to connect with people each day or each week about you know someone who values that you're home parenting someone who gets it I mean, it is it's real it's beautiful but it's relentless right yeah yeah I, feel, I do feel like, like men and women underestimate um, the increased load on them for each day of work. Like I, so I've witnessed in myself and with my clients, there's a big difference between one and two days. There's a big difference between two and three days work. Yeah. There's a big difference between three and four. Yeah. And but I think because we want to be superheroes, super women, and super men, we just want to be able to do it, right? We want to be able to say yes to an opportunity just to do it. But I think we underestimate how great the load is on us with mm -hmm. each day that we add and also um, I learnt from um, so I've got a background in mental health and um, counselling as well and in family systems theory the transition of going we underestimate transitions so a transition um, you know there's potentially three or four transitions when we go back to work there's one us physically going back to the job which is a transition yeah. and not feeling potentially like the same person we were before mm. there's a transition of our child in whatever childcare scenario that is. There's then the transition of our partner because potentially they have to take up more of a domestic load. Mm. And then there's a the transition of any other child in the scenario. So, I, yeah, we underestimate what it takes to do this and what, then what it takes behind the scenes for us to do this. Mm. I think that that internal story seems like the biggest factor for the people certainly that I'm having conversations with, that it is... What will people think of me? How will I justify what I do every day? You know, and it really probably comes down to meaning and purpose and contribution and self-esteem and those sorts of things and not feeling like if you're out of the job market for five years because you've chosen to stay at home and parent, then how do you get back in? Because it's so ruthless and maybe it is, maybe it's not. But all those things are the considerations yeah. people seem to be having. Yeah, and I had a 
recent client who um, she left a, uh, she was in a three day run of publishing and the budgets kept changing and I expected to do more with less and she she wasn't coping and she gave herself she was in a financial position that she could give herself, I think it was nine months off. Yeah. Um, one was at school, one wasn't. And um, and she found herself in this cycle of anxiety. She thought she'd be smelling the roses. She couldn't wait. But she was just anxious because um, it just it wasn't what she'd expected it to be. And I think she felt compelled to get a job as well. Um, so the solution we found was to incorporate some mini experiments into her week which were based on fun and exploring a purpose, exploring what interested her. So just having a bit of structure in there and potentially it was just, honestly, it was potentially two hours a week mm. that she was doing these mini experiments and they were around floristry and, and tennis and reading and architecture. Awesome. Yeah? Yeah. And that and she went from flat and anxious to, ah, huh, because she had something to talk about apart from the kids and I think that's what we're drawing upon. Who am I if I'm a parent? And and you can see that you this lot you can see the loss of identity. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. And people I'm amazed at how people say, When are you going back to work? Do you find that? People so clients say to me, I'm constantly asked, When am I going back to work? Right. Mm. Don't we do that as humans though? When are you having another baby? When are you getting married? When are you, you know, it's like don't stop, keep going. <laughs> yeah, which is how we're living. So you talk a lot about mini experiments, and I guess um, so. If we're talking to um, a bunch of people who, not all, but you know, who lots of people have um, issues with fatigue and exhaustion, mm. where they fit in society, identity, wanting to contribute, um, those sort of. I don't want to say stuck. That's not always strictly true. But, you know, based on the conversation we've had, are there many experiments that maybe you can recommend for people to start playing around with? Yeah, I, absolutely. So um, the beauty about mini experiments is you start off with micro ones. They're one-hour ones. We're, we're building up ease and clarity and momentum and we're wanting to make them as joyful and simple as possible because if you are burnt out or exhausted or feeling lost or a bit flat, I mean, hey, we want something easy, right? Mm. So, um, Yeah, not another I, task. <laughs> yeah, I run a webinar every month which uncovers these mini experiments, but I'll give you a taster of that now. Would that be helpful? And the webinar is free, so people can sign up every month. So what we want to, what I want you to think about is if you had all the money, time and talent in the world, you had all the money, time and talent in the world, you know, what would your dream lives be? Okay, and from that we actually tease out the mini experiments. So, for example, say um, a dream life for you is um, I see speakers travelling the world and getting paid. That looks fun. I just that go was... straight to a beach, Nick. I'll just go What's your one? straight to the beach. I'm just like yeah. by the pool, at the beach, whatever. Maybe. I've got that's one of mine too. Uh, caretaker of Richard Branson's Island. Yeah. <laughs> Fantastic. Right? Yeah. So the mini experiment would if so if we go with B ones first and maybe we'll pull out some of your other dream lines. Um, so with bees, um, I want to be by a pool or a beach. Perfect. They don't have to be occupational based. They can be lifestyle, yeah. beautiful, you know, gorgeous. It can be full time traveler. It can be yeah. um, things like that. So with that one, your micro experiments will be planning, either planning your next holiday to be by the pool or the beach, okay. or depending <laughs> on the weather, say if it's summer, yeah. then don't you give yourself permission to go to the pool that day, and maybe you do the bills tomorrow. Yeah. Yeah, okay. So it's all about connecting with that idea, even in the simplest way. Um, I'm just trying to think. Um, yeah, and then say, should we pull another, another of your dream lives out? Well, just on the back of that one, I was thinking if I could be a professional, um, like someone who assesses people's massage technique, like <laughs> just get massaged all the time. Yes, perfect. I'm How good is that? Silly, but I actually so is, love the, that. is the dream life assessing them or is it having a massage whenever you want? It's having a massage. Yeah. 
So um, oh, I love that one. I'm now adding that to my dream last week. <laughs> and my, my holy grail is to have a massage once a week. I currently have one a month. And I actually trade services with the beautiful Allie Hunt. That's awesome. Yeah. So um, with that, if that's your dream life, then you imagine the simple solution is to book in a massage. If you can't afford it, is there is there a creative way that you could experience that? So, for example, you might go to a, um, a university where students offer them for free or for $15, or you might do what I do and I think B is going to do in the future, which is trade with a masseuse, yeah. which is it's such a beautiful exchange of energy and you just don't – and you don't – it's more easeful because you're not paying for it out of your bank account. There's just ease in there. Yeah, great. Yeah. So really it sounds like you just start taking out the barriers for people and coming up with ways for them to start connecting with the things that they actually want to do. Yes. So I'll give you a, yes, exactly. Um, and what we're wanting to do is we're wanting to collect data and evidence of, you know, before, during and after. Is this a cool thing? Is this a positive thing? Is this a fulfilling thing? Is this a joyful thing? So say for the massage, you, you might trade services with someone yeah. and you do it once and go, how did I feel before, during, and after? Pretty awesome. Let's do that again. Yeah. Um, I'll give you an example around the floristry with my client because I think that might help. Um, so with perhaps a more occupational but yet joyful idea. Mm -hmm. Now she's she's um, got a law degree and she's worked in publishing and floristry is one of her dream lives. Okay, so she's got in her head, what are people going to think of me? Mm. Okay? Yeah. Um, but the, what's beautiful about the mini experiments is you get to build up the clarity and confidence as well. So um, some people might want to volunteer, you know, say, can I just volunteer and sweep up, you know, volunteer for an hour a week or a day a week. For her, she wants to feel competent at it before, excuse me, before she goes to a florist. So she's enrolling in short courses. The first one, was a two-hour wreath-making course around Christmas time. And she was on a high, for, I'm not joking, for three weeks after that. Wow. She was on a high from that wreath-making workshop. Awesome. I think it cost <laughs> $60 or something. It was thought. Saturday. Yeah, yeah, she had to organize her family. Yeah. Uh, but she was on a high. Awesome. Um, so, yeah, the next one is she's going to watch some YouTube videos and practice at home some arranging, yeah. and then she might find another course. Yeah, great. But the idea is with these mini experiments, we're not putting timelines or pressure on ourselves. We actually create magic when we give ourselves time. So, um, for example, I created a singing career from eight mini experiments over 18 months, and a teacher mentored me through that. I had actually no intention on performing. So that's the kind of magic that happens out of them. And this current business, a lot of my clients start creating businesses along the side to create that flexibility in their lives. And we know from, you probably know the first year or two in business that you not yeah, it takes a few years to set up, mm -hmm. but that's why they set it up on the side to test the idea. That's often a mini experiment as well. Yeah. But this, I mean, I'm really proud of this business that supports my family was a one to three hour mini experiment for a year. Wow. Yeah, so in that first year, I was literally spending between one to three hours on it. I had worked as a redundancy outplacement coach, so I knew I had the skills. Mm. I wanted to go out on my own because the redundancy outplacement company only gave me 15 minutes to help to talk to people about what their dream job would be. And I thought, not enough time. But I, I still wasn't sure. I gave myself a year, can I create a program that's better? Can I test it out with some clients and get some confidence and case studies and some and evidence? And a risk environment where it's not your primary income. Yeah, great. Yes. I'm actually liking the idea of mini experiments. Some of our patients are also struggling to find their tribe. You know, kids yeah. have left home, job profiles changed, um, and they're kind of going, uh, or even like we were talking before, parents who suddenly find that their world has kind of shifted and they're trying to identify who they are. I love the idea of mini experiments to try and find your people. Um, you know, I was talking to a guy last week who's moved you know, from another town to, to Melbourne, and he's really feeling the difference between uh, the disconnect, but even with his group, because he's moving off and evolving and changing beliefs and growing. Um, and I think even for someone like him, many experiments might be really fantastic of ways of accessing people who are on his current wavelength. Ah, uh, absolutely. And uh, the, what I like about how many experiments works with that is 
we just look at the mini experiment in front of us. Mm. So say, for example, you're looking for your tribe, then the first port of call might be to think of, well, what interests do I have? Is it artwork at a gallery? Is it exercise and a fitness mm. group? Is it um, I love photography, I'll find a photography oh, course. Food. So you can attach it to an interest. But what I love too is you're not marrying that group. <laughs> you're, yeah. you're just dating them. You're, it's one date, dating. one mini, <laughs> mini dating. Mini dating. Yeah. One mini experiment or date at a time. Yeah. And I can give you a personal example. We moved, um, we did a sea change four years ago. So we live in Barman Heads in Victoria. Yeah. We, we only knew two or three people when we moved here. And it's funny, I had um, a local woman saying, you need to come to Icebergers with us. So they go every morning at 6 or 7 a.m. Um, into the water. Cold water sea swim, yeah? Yeah, so the water's not that cold in summer, but it's certainly getting cold now. Yeah. Um, I love catching waves, and that's what they do. They don't swim kilometres, they just catch waves. Mm. Um, I actually felt kind of, I felt like it was hard to fit in, actually, to leave my, I'd go on a Saturday, so to leave my family at 6 or 7 a.m. just didn't feel right. Now that my kids are a bit older, I gave it a mini experiment. If I had had to commit to it for the year, I don't think I would have done it, mm. but I went along once and loved it, loved it, loved it, loved it. Cool. But I've even been saying to them, I'm just taking a week at a time. I've even been saying them to them that. They, they want to know. Four years. Four years. <laughs> So I only actually just started in December, okay, so just cool. five months ago. Awesome. It's one of my favourite things now. Awesome. And I wouldn't have done it if I'd had to commit to an epic period of time. I really did need to use it as a mini experiment. Yeah, great. Um, but finding, yeah, finding a tribe, it's, you know, you could set three mini experiments, three different groups, and just know that I'm just testing it out. I'm just yeah. trying it once. Yeah. Because you really don't know until you try, do you? No, of course not. No, and it can be scary and intimidating. And I think if you've got the, the doors half open where you you know you're not committing um, and you don't have to like it, like trying a new food. Just chew it a couple of times and <laughs> see if it tastes any good. <laughs> awesome. Nikki, you are so generous with your time. Now, if people want to um, connect and find out more about what you do and maybe join one of your webinars, which I'm definitely going to do, when's your next one? Uh, it will be mid, uh, where are we now? It'll be mid to late July. Okay. Um, so what I do is I update, I've got a web page. Mm -hmm. It's nikkismith.net.au forward slash webinars. Yep. So if you, yeah, we'll, we'll put a link in the show notes or something. Let's call them show notes. <laughs> N-I-K-K-I-S-M-I-T-H dot net dot A-U forward slash, it's either webinar or webinars. And um, the updated one goes there. Um, they're also listed as an event on my Facebook page, Nikki Smith Coach. So that's a really fun and easeful way to start exploring. I mean, you'll get dream job ideas, but you'll also get this fun and excitement um, element. Um, you probably know this, but one hour of pure fun reduces your cortisol level by 50% for three days. I didn't know that. So even if you come on the webinar to get what, what's my fun going to start being, because I, I also felt post-kids I forgot what fun was. Yeah. <laughs> well, I, I started to... asking friends out on play dates because yeah. <laughs> I want to go and have play dates with people. <laughs> Exactly, exactly. And it, but isn't it bizarre how it takes a bit of discipline to give give something to ourselves? Mm. So again, these mini, um, with the webinar, you get ideas that are so magnetic, hopefully, that you just want to and you'll be more driven to do it. Yeah, so that's one way to connect. Um, I'm also happy I've got a free strengths guide that we can post as well. Awesome. And that's nikkismith.net.au forward slash strengths guide. Um, so that gives you a step-by-step -step process to how to use the online assessment that I recommend and then what to do with it once you've got it um, because it's incredible when you – it's a big confidence booster reading that strengths report yeah. and it will also give you um, – uh, in the strengths guide I do a webinar where I provide questions about how you can figure out, well, am I using them at work? What can I dial up? What can I dial down? Um, so that's really helpful as well. And I thought I think I had one more hint for everyone. Hmm. Oh, yeah, just if you want to chat more, if you're thinking, oh, I just want to chat more to Nikki, just send me an email at nikki at nikkismith.net.au and I'm happy to chat. I offer a free 15-minute chat so you can just book in for that. You are the best. Thank you so much. You're welcome. That was fun.